elementary schools, and they've really learned a lot and done some good things. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> we did the same kind of thing here at West Houston Bible Church starting this last year. And um, we started off with 145 kids signing up for one good news club, which was a little bit challenging. But fortunately, they didn't all show up. And uh, we actually, I don't think we ever had any more than about 110 or 112. But who's counting? And now it's down to about a manageable 60 or 70. But we have seen about a dozen or more kids at least. I don't know that we've kept count. It may be quite a bit more than that by now. Right, Alan, how many kids have gotten saved? Uh, Catherine? How many kids have gotten saved? It's a number question. (laughs) Five, ten, fifteen? Well, how many Bibles have you given? How many Bibles have you given out? Okay, she gives out Bibles. If you want to get saved, you get a free Bible. (laughs) And you get to talk to the beautiful Catherine Tapping. So, you know, there's all kinds of side benefits for that. (laughs) So anyhow, so, so quite a few have gotten saved. And these little kids will come up and they'll say, you mean that, that if we die, there's a life after this? Is that what you're saying? I mean, this is from like a second grader or first grader. You mean there's a life after this one? Yeah. Wow. So it, it just has great blessings, and it's a great way to be involved in the, in the community. So Dan's going to talk about that for about 15 or 20 minutes or so, or as long as the Spirit moves him. All right. Well, thank you, Robbie. What I'd love to do uh, as we start here is tell about three or four stories about my good friend, uh, Robert Dean. But uh, that's right. It is mixed mixed company. Let's take just a few seconds uh, as I open us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this marvelous opportunity that we have to come here to uh, West Houston Bible Church for this conference. We're also thankful that you have a plan, that we're in that plan, and that a part of that plan was for Child Evangelism Fellowship to have access to public elementary schools in the United States during this particular time. We pray, Father, that we would take advantage of that, certainly understand it, and that it would have an impact on this nation. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Child Evangelism Fellowship, United States of America and also international. Here is the uh, online access to them. Uh, I don't know how many of you have heard of Child Evangelism Fellowship. Uh, Why don't we just raise our hands. How many have heard of Child Evangelism Fellowship? Quite a few. Excellent. The next question, how many have actually been involved with Child Evangelism Fellowship in a local school? Wonderful. Many pastors that I'll call and talk to them about Child Evangelism Fellowship, they'll say, I- I've never heard of that. I've never heard of that. And then when I say that they could be in their local elementary school, they say, well, you couldn't do that down here. That couldn't be done here. And I say, well, yes, as a matter of fact, it not only can it, but it probably is being done. Well, Robbie asked me to talk about Child Evangelism Fellowship and what we are doing at the National Capital Bible Church. So everything I'm going to say now, I'm going to try to build to that so I can tell you what we're doing and some, with some emphasis at the end on why we are doing this. So first of all, what is Child Evangelism Fellowship? Well, in approximately the 1930s, there was a young man who was the son of immigrants to the United States, uh, living in California. And he had a passion for children. He wanted to ensure that children heard the gospel. And matter of fact, there was a booklet written about his life. His name was Jesse Oberholzer. And as he grew up, Mr. Oberholzer, as a believer, said, 
this is something that I want to do. I want to ensure that the gospel, that the word of God is given to children because he saw so many children that had not heard the gospel. And so without any money or little or no money, he travels to Chicago where he knocks on doors of some of the biggest churches trying to get pastors to support what he's, uh, his uh, desire, his ambition, which was to develop an organization called Child Evangelism Fellowship. Well, he was able to get it off the ground, and slowly it spread throughout the United States and then into Latin America and then around the world. And today, internationally, there are uh, hundreds of clubs, but uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship is in probably uh, 185 plus countries around the world. And they are in every state here in the United States. Am I doing something wrong here? So, they are, they are in every state in the United States. And today, there are somewhere in the vicinity of 4,000 plus good news clubs in the United States. How did that happen? How did that grow? Well, originally... Child Evangelism Fellowship was simply in a backyard. They were called backyard Bible clubs or five-day clubs. Five-day clubs, or we would probably call them much like uh, our daily vacation Bible schools during the summer. They would meet sequentially for five days for an hour at someone's home. The backyard Bible clubs would do the same thing. They would meet in someone's home in the backyard or in the house, either one. And for a long time, that's essentially, they, they had other ministries, but that's how they were truly evangelizing children. Well, that developed into a club, which and some of you may remember this phrase, I don't know that I'd ever heard of it, called release time clubs. And release time clubs were associated with the public schools. And many of us growing up remember that we would go to school in the morning and then at noon there'd be a noon hour. And if you lived close, you could walk home and eat lunch at home and then come back. Or you could do other things, I guess, uh, over that period of time. So one of the things that Child Evangelism Fellowship decided to do was to run clubs during the lunch hour. And so children would leave school, go to a home very close by where they would eat, but they would also hear a Bible lesson memorize scripture, sing songs, play games, and then they would go back to school. A pastor in upstate New York said, why would we want to waste time leaving the school to get to someone's home, to go to someone's home, walk to their home, and then back again? Why not just have the club in school? And so in the late 90s, he approached the principal and said, what I would like to do is hold this club, this release time club in the school. And, of course, the principal said no. That would be a violation of church and state. He said, how in the world can that be possible? I'm a paying citizen. I'm paying my taxes. And you have other clubs in this school. It seems to me that there shouldn't be a distinction between uh, whether it's a Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, a French club, a gymnastics club, or a Bible club. Well, no, that would we just couldn't do that. Well, he didn't accept that. He took it to the next level, took him to court, and, of course, the answer was no. Hmm. Next level, no. Next level, no. Finally, the Supreme Court, the guy wouldn't give up. And the Supreme Court said, yes. The landmark decision in the summer of 2001 was that in any public school where there were other after-school clubs, Child Evangelism Fellowship had equal access. Unbelievable. As a matter of fact, when you probably in the audience right now, you'd say, I don't believe it. I absolutely don't believe that. Well... Do you know who wrote the opinion for that? Scalia and Clarence Thomas. 
They were the ones that wrote the opinion. And it stood. There have been many challenges, but it has, every time it's been challenged, that ruling has stood. And so while there are still uh, schools, and of course, Child Evangelism Fellowship is focused on children, so they have had a, a high school and they do have middle school programs, but their real emphasis is on elementary schools. And so they have developed all every kind of material that you would possibly want to have a Bible club in elementary schools. And as I started to say, there is very often some resistance. The only resistance that really works effectively is that the school has to eliminate all after-school clubs in order to prevent Child Evangelism Fellowship from having an after-school club. There are other things such as, well, we just don't have any space. And we've actually had schools try to fill every space with um, school-sponsored activities to keep Child Evangelism Fellowship out. But the fact is that that ruling opens the doors to Child Evangelism Fellowship. Now, it doesn't open the doors to your church or to any organization. It was very narrowly written for Child Evangelism Fellowship. The remarkable thing about Child Evangelism Fellowship is that they are a very sound organization. Now, we wouldn't agree with everything that they say or the way that they say it, but then we don't even agree every now and or most of the time or some of the time with the way we say things. How many times have we gone back and looked at a few things that we've said and said, oh, I probably wish I hadn't said it quite that way. <clears throat> but I would say in about 95 plus percent of the time, as you read through their Bible stories, you'll say, this is great. This is wonderful. Now, how did I find out about Child Evangelism Fellowship? When I was in seminary, I was taking a practical course. We had to develop lesson plans to teach, and it just so happened that we had to to develop three of them. We had to develop an adult lesson plan to teach a Bible class. We had to develop a teen, and we had to develop a, uh, one for children. And we had to do it in three different uh, venues. One was had to be at least four people working together, so it was a team-taught effort. Another one was just two, so it was p- just partnered. And then there was you had to develop one for yourself. Well, as it turned out, the one that I was developing for myself was for children. And I was, I was wondering where I was going to find the material. A friend of mine up in uh, Virginia said, well, you know, Child Evangelism Fellowship has excellent material for children. You might want to uh, use some of their material. I, I'd never heard of them. Went over to a, an office in Maryland. They were very helpful. Ended up using their material to teach that class. I really enjoyed it and then promptly forgot about it. Several years later, <clears throat> pastor of the National Capital Bible Church I was at a, a meeting of other pastors, and there was a, a gentleman there who was not a pastor, but he was the director of Child Evangelism Fellowship for Northern Virginia. And I remembered Child Evangelism Fellowship, so I just walked over to say hello to him, just the natural, friendly spirit. And as I was talking to him, he said, uh, are you involved at all with Child Evangelism Fellowship? I said, well, I, I've used your materials, but... He said, but is your church involved with Child Evangelism Fellowship? I said, no. He said, well, have you thought about having a Bible club in one of your local elementary schools? I said, are you got to be kidding me? I, I, no, I, the answer is no. I've never thought of that because I don't think it can be done. He said, well, if you had a team from your church that wanted to teach a Bible class in one of the local elementary schools, would that be of interest to you? I said, absolutely. I think it, we, would, we would want to do that. He said, I can get you in a local school. And I couldn't believe it. Well, I talked to him some more, gained the information that uh, he could tell me. And I said, I'm going to take this back to the church because a, a little insight here. <clears throat> the church that I pastor at that time was in Arlington, Virginia. Now, Arlington, Virginia as all of us know, is part of the South. It used to be 
part of the South. Alexandria, Virginia, and Arlington, Virginia, are now, um, well, they're just about as liberal as any place you can find in the country. And the reason that they are that way is because we keep sending liberals to, uh, to Washington, D.C., and they need to find a place to live. And they love living in Arlington and Alexandria. And now that entire area is as liberal as it could possibly be to include the schools. And so for us to have an impact on those schools, that community would, was just a wonderful thought to me and to my congregation. So the Child Evangelism Fellowship representative, the director for Northern Virginia, came to our church. I gave him an opportunity to speak to the church on one Wednesday evening, and we had somewhere in the vicinity of 25 to 30 people who were very interested. And we decided that we wanted to pursue this. He said, well, the first thing you need to do is be trained and find out how many people actually want to participate in one of these Good News Club teams. In other words, we're not gonna, we are not going to find a school and then find out that your church is not able to support it. So we had the training. This is January, February, and by March, we were ready to go. We were trained, and we decided that we would like to try a good news club in one of the local schools. And I asked, uh, his name was Wayne Radio, I asked the director, is there an opportunity for us to see a good news club in action? We've, we've seen it in a video. And he said, well, and I think by this time it was <clears throat> probably in May, he said, we will be running five-day clubs down at Fort Belvoir, Army base just south of us. And he said, those five-day clubs, one hour each, each day, is exactly how we run a good news club. He said, if you'd like to come down and observe them, that, that would be wonderful. So I did. And I'm down at Fort Belvoir observing teenagers teaching children. And they're giving these children the gospel they're teaching them memory verses. They're singing songs and playing games with them and teaching them Bible lessons. And the children are just ecstatic. They're having a great time. And their parents standing around outside the gazebos uh, watching, and I'm standing there with them, marveling at how well this is, is going. One of the things I learned from this is that children just adore teenagers. They, they just love them. Well, one of the mothers asked me, <clears throat> she walked up and introduced herself, and I introduced myself, and she said, why don't we have one of these clubs in the elementary school on base here? I said, I don't know. I don't know why we don't, but I'll find out. You know, it's always a good answer. I have no idea, but I'll find out. So I spoke to a, one of the chaplains, and the <clears throat> Good News Club, Child Evangelism Fellowship, a board base is sponsored by the chaplains. So I asked the chaplain who was in charge. And he said, well, honestly, I don't know. I'm a reservist, and this is my, uh, my active duty during the summer. He said, but I'll ask. About that time, Wayne Radio walked up, and I said, Wayne, do we not have a good news club, or have we ever tried to have a good news club aboard base? He said, absolutely. The principal here loves the good news club. We've had one aboard base for the past or for five years until last year when the church that was had adopted the school could no longer support it. And I can't find another church to come and, and take over the Bible club. So I said, You're telling me that there is an elementary school here, by the way, that's outsourced to Fairfax County Public Schools. There's a school, an elementary school, who wants to have a Bible club in their school and you can't find a church to support that Bible club. No, I can't. I said, well, let me talk to my congregation. So I went back and <clears throat> Randy Bissell, some of you may know him, he's a retired colonel in the army, said, well, why don't we take that, that school? And I said, 
fine, Randy, he and his wife, decided that they wanted to take that school, and so we just put together a team, and the next thing I knew, we were in Fort Belvoir running a good news club. Of course, we were not going to start down there until the fall, <clears throat> but we really had wanted... Now, this is, how, this is how God works. We wanted one club, essentially. Well, this club was 10, 15 miles away from the church. We kind of wanted to have one locally. <clears throat> so we're now looking for our second club. And Wayne Radio said, all right, you've got about seven clubs around your church, or seven elementary schools within several miles of your church. Which one would you like to pick? Well, being the patriot, let's go to Patrick Henry. <laughs> so we went to Patrick Henry and the, the principal... This was our first experience. The principal said, okay, sure, you can have an after-school club. We're not going to be able to support you the first semester here in the, in the fall semester because I believe there was some construction going on. <clears throat> but we'd be happy to have you here in the spring. And we said, great. I mean, when someone says, yes, we would like to have a club, you say, fine. Well, we're still not in a local club. And so members of the team said, well, why don't we look at another elementary school? I'm thinking, that's three. We're looking for one. <laughs> but the, the group that wanted, that had responded to this, said, let's look for another one. So we went to Claremont Immersion School, uh, Spanish Immersion School, <clears throat> and we met some resistance. And there's a whole story around how that resistance fell but we were in that school. Now, I couldn't believe it. I had thought that maybe one school would be great. Two was just outside my um, thinking that, that would be, we would be able to do that. But now three, we're running three, <clears throat> not a large church, as a matter of fact, a small church, running three clubs. And Wayne Radio, who is the director for Child Evangelism and Fellowship in Northern Virginia, said, We've just about doubled the number of schools here in Northern Virginia. I couldn't believe that. They simply had very few schools, uh, very few good news clubs. And the reason is because he, they were having difficulty finding churches to adopt the schools. And I'll talk about that in a, just a, a minute here. Well, <clears throat> two of the schools, Claremont starts small, single-digit with numbers of children. But that's fine. We have a lot to learn. And having five or six children is helping us to grow. Uh, when Patrick Henry comes online, there was 10 there. Admittedly, down at Fort Belvoir, they knocked our socks off. We, accept, we expected maybe 20 because a school had been there, and we ended up with 50-plus kids the first day. And so we were suddenly in three schools, and we had a lot to learn. But those are the three schools that... We've stayed with them, and we've been in them now for five years. And one of the things that I decided as a pastor was that if I was going to recommend this to my congregation, I needed to know about the clubs. And so I just said, I'll, I'll lead one of them myself and chose Patrick Henry. And I led that for, for four years, and now I'm over in Claremont. And it has been a true blessing because – and uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute – uh, I have learned more about probably giving the gospel and working with a team in ministry in leading those those clubs and being part of those clubs than I think I probably have anywhere else. Now, some of you might wonder, well, how does a club begin? Well, it's very simple. There has to be an interest in the local community to have that club. And a club can be run individually. There are many husband-wife teams that teach good news clubs in a local elementary school. But the way Child Evangelism Fellowship would prefer that it works is that a local church adopt a school. And many of our churches have elementary schools within a, a mile. Some of them are across the street. And you could actually have a public elementary school. You could actually have a Bible club in that school 
as long as there are other after-school clubs, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts. And there are some churches that develop a relationship with an elementary school so that they're doing more than just teaching a Bible club. They'll have uh, clothes drives, food drives, working with the parents, and it's just remarkable. And I can tell you that in all three of the schools that we're in, we have members of the staff or teachers that will come up and say, we're really glad you're here. This is an answer to prayer. We don't know how you're here, but we're not asking. (laughs) And, of course, the parents absolutely love it. They also can't believe that their children are being taught memory verses and Bible lessons in the public school. Well, again, there has to be an interest, I would say, in the local church. And as soon as the local church has the ability to send a team, then Child Evangelism Fellowship goes to the local school and gains access. That's how, that's a, that's how it works. And Child Evangelism Fellowship has the material, has the training to conduct with your, uh, your local church to prepare you for those good news clubs. And again, Child Evangelism Fellowship material is excellent. Um, Bracket Church used it in the 50s and 60s. As a matter of fact, I think Betty Thiem had a backyard Bible club in her home. And in talking to other uh, uh, adults that I knew uh, and still know in Bracket Church, they'd say, yeah, we still have uh, Child Evangelism Fellowship material around here. So it's the material is excellent, and they provide that. The lessons, not only do they provide a sequence on how to run a club, But they provide you with the songs. They provide you with the memory verses. They have all the training aids. The lessons used to be just outlined, although they would prefer that the teacher outlines the passage that they're going to teach themselves. This week we're teaching the parable on talents. Um, But the lessons are now scripted. They're written out. And there are uh, applications inserted at various points for the unsaved child and for the saved child. And the script is not designed to be read, although I think sometimes it could because, to me, they're, they're exciting in their presentation. But they're designed for the teacher to have a sense of how to teach that Bible lesson. And you read it, and you take as much of that as you can, and then you teach it using the training aids. I'm going to show us here in a minute uh, some examples from... Uh, our classes. Uh, Parents give their permission. How does that happen? Child Evangelism Fellowship will send a sheet to the local school. On one side is a flyer that explains what the club is, and on the other side is the permission slip. Parents very often don't recognize it. They get a lot of stuff from their kids coming home, and sometimes it gets thrown out. But many of them will look at it, and many of them will give their permission, and their child will show up at your club. And that's how we, we've started. Uh, it's been a, a great blessing. Uh, let me show you just a few. Oh, and then the question is, why did, why did I think Child Evangelism Fellowship was important? And why have I developed a passion for it? It's developed over these five years. And there's several reasons. Uh, let's just look here. First of all, this is one of the members of our, cl- our team at Claremont Elementary School. That happens to be a mother. She's a mother that goes to a local church, but she volunteered to assist us at Claremont, and she's absolutely remarkable. And she has four children in our club. She brings her youngest one, who is four, and he's part of the club. He's an active part of the club, might I say, (laughs) but he's part of the club. And she says, I'd like to be involved. And so here she is teaching the memory portion part of the the club. So first of all, I, I gave you one reason. I couldn't believe that we could do this. I couldn't believe that we could actually be in a public school and be teaching the Bible. Now, just because you have an opportunity, that may not be the reason to do it. But it's an opportunity to reach children. So that's... That's one of the, that was the first, my first thought. I just couldn't believe it. we're going to try this. Secondly, it is community outreach because we are not only reaching the children, but we're reaching the parents through the children. 
And the way that we do that, there's many ways to do it. You'll, you'll see very often the parents when they come to pick up the children. Sometimes your children come from an, a, uh, an extended day uh, organization or an after-school sort of uh, daycare for the kids until their parents can come pick them up. But many of the parents will come, and you'll have a chance to talk to them. The other way we do this is that we have their email addresses. And so at least twice a week, I interact with the parents. The first way is to send them an email that says, tomorrow, the Good News Club is going to meet. This is the memory verse that your child is supposed to know. Please help them with that memory verse. And this is going to be the lesson. Then another bullet will be, this is the lesson we're going to teach and give them the, the, the scripture. Then tell them to wear their blue. You can see she's wearing a, 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 a blue shirt. It says, I'm a member of a good news club. Here's another picture. Uh, Bill Sen here, member of our church. Uh, says, I'm a member of the, a Good News Club. I say, it's Blue Shirt Thursday. Wear your, blue, your Good News Club shirt. So it is community outreach. We're reaching those parents. Uh, a third reason was that witnessing to children is unbelievable. They're ready to believe. I've witnessed, and I don't consider myself to be uh, skilled necessarily, but I've witnessed to adults and I've witnessed to teens. And there's always objections. There's always a reason why, well, why they are not ready to believe. A child is just tell me what I need to know and I'll believe. It's really that simple. I was stunned. You're a hero. Those children are ready to believe. Just give us the gospel. We believe it. And I think that's, of course, what Christ told us, the faith of a young child. They're so ready to believe. Well, there's a couple other reasons. My concern for America. I know that all of us look around us and say, what is happening to America? Where are we going? What's wrong? We're a nation that was established on biblical principles, and now... The Bible has left our schools. Prayer has left our schools. God has left our schools. Christmas has left our schools. We can take the Bibles right back in to the local school. And I think, and I use two analogies here. One is the Sodom analogy. How many people how many believers would it have taken to save Sodom and the cities of the plain? Ten. Now, I don't know what the number is for the United States, but there's got to be a number. And I believe that we can feed the pivot to ensure that we attain that number. And the easiest way to do it is at the low-hanging fruit. Children. Children are ready to believe. They're ready to be added to the local church. So the, the, next one, the next analogy is one that uh, Andy used, the Exodus generation. The Exodus generation, you know, there came a time when God was no longer working with that generation, and he's working with the younger generation, and they're ready. The, uh, here's a couple other pictures, just very quickly. Singing a song. Here's Randy teaching a class. Singing a song here at uh, Fort Belvoir. Uh-oh. There's the uh, pastor himself up front. He's good news club shirt. Uh, that's right. <laughs> Marina is uh, a Russian um, who is her husband is working here locally with us. Well, the answer, the final answer I have is the impact on members of my church. Impact on members of my church has been remarkable. And I can go into that in greater detail. I'm being given the cut signal. But here is my final line. There's our team, Claremont. Why Child Evangelism Fellowship? We need to take back America one elementary school at a time. And I think that that's one of the answers to this nation is the next generation. Thank you for your attention.
By the way, Dan is going to be uh, going along as a leader on the next Israel trip in November. And just to put a challenge for some of you guys that are out there that are pastors, that if you want to go to Israel, but you're saying, yeah, how can I afford it? If you can bring 13 people, then then your, your trip to